Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barkley and I'm Manager of Communities here at ASUG Headquarters. I'd like to welcome you today to the Fisker Automotive Leverages SAP Technology to create, a next, to create the next generation car company, BPC Webcast, and thank you for participating today. A few housekeeping notes to keep in mind. All of our participants' lines are currently on mute. However, we would like to make sure that you're asking the questions throughout the webcast. If you do have a question, please make sure to type it in the, low, in the Q and A panel in the lower right corner of your screen. Please be sure to make to make all of your questions visible in the Q and A panel. It's located in the lower right corner of your screen. Time permitting, I will come back on after the presentation and we'll give you directions on how to ask questions over the phone line if you would like to ask them out loud. Today's webcast is being recorded, and the recording will be sent out to all the registrants and posted to ASUG.com. I now I'd like to turn it over to our speaker today, Charles Wilson from RJT CompuQuest. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, everybody, for uh, joining us today and uh, making the time in your schedule to do that. And uh, thank you to ASUG and to Fisker Automotive for uh, joining us for this uh, presentation as well. So really uh, what we want to accomplish today is uh, first uh, – We'll introduce uh, Michael Eli, who's uh, Director of IT at uh, Fisker Automotive. Um, Fisker has done quite a bit of work with uh, SAP Solutions. And, uh, and so we'll get a chance to have a conversation with him, learn a little bit about uh, how Fisker Automotive is uh, leveraging SAP to really uh, develop this next generation car company. Uh, and we'll also do a, a presentation on uh, business planning and consolidation or business objects planning consolidation from SAP to introduce anybody that's on the on the call to that particular solution and then we will open up the call at the end to answer any questions uh, that you may have either for uh, Michael or I or myself uh, regarding this particular solution. Um, Michael are you there? I'm here. Hi Michael. Uh, first of all uh, again thanks for uh, making the time uh, with us today. Appreciate it. Um, obviously, we've done a fair amount of work together over the years, and, um, and you've done a, a lot of work, I know, with SAP. Um, I'm sure a lot of uh, individuals on, the, on this call are interested in understanding a little bit more about you know, who Fisker Automotive is and what the, what the company is all about and uh, what you mean by trying to create the next generation car company. Maybe you can talk sure. about that a little bit. All right. So, yeah. So, Fisker Automotive, we are an American car company. Uh, we design, develop, and make and sell a premium hybrid uh, electric vehicle, uh, the Fisker Karma. We're a relatively new company, um, founded in 2007 by Henrik Fisker and Bonnie Kohler, uh, both with many years of automotive background. Henrik Fisker probably. Uh, well known for uh, being the designer uh, behind the Aston Martin DB9, the Aston Martin Vantage, the BMW Z8. He was also um, responsible for um, some some um, development work at Ford as well. And so our mission is to create uh, environmentally conscious vehicles with uh, style, with power, and with performance. Uh, and the first vehicle, the Karma, is now on the roads uh, in the U.S. and in Europe. Later on this year, it'll be on the roads in China and in the in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, from there, we've derived we've announced a couple of additional derivatives on the Karma platform: the Sunset, which is a, um, uh, and the Surf. The Sunset is a uh, convertible, and the Surf is a uh, what we call a shooting brake or more of a station wagon looking. Uh, car, and then we're also working on our midsize platform, what we call Project Nina. And uh, if you have followed us in the press, uh, you've you've seen that we have announced and shown pictures of the uh, Fisker Atlantic sedan, which is the first car on that uh, platform. And so uh, we're here. We're headquarters in uh, headquartered in uh, Anaheim, California. Engineering, design, sales. Uh, all of headquarter functions are here in uh, in Anaheim. We did acquire a um, three and a half million square feet manufacturing assembly plant in Wilmington in Delaware, where our plan is to uh, manufacture our vehicles moving forwards. Fantastic! So, uh, sounds like quite the undertaking. 
Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's it's not uh, it, it, for me. It's a it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? Uh, it's to come in and help build a company from from the bottoms up. So it's it, but it is built and it is uh, you know building a, a car company from from the bottoms up. So lots of lots of uh, complexities and lots of things to do. And uh, you know, very early, I, I joined this company a couple of years ago, and and uh, you know the what the the task that was given to me that I was asked to be part of was to help get the company operational. At the time, uh, it, we were really a product development company uh, with lots of engineers, um, and, and we were slowly building, well, actually very uh, uh, rapidly building our operational team, sales, marketing, logistics, production control and logistics, and, and um, after sales and so forth, purchasing. Uh, materials management and so forth. And so, uh, what we did was we um, we did select SAP to be uh, our enterprise uh, wide platform uh, for our operations, and we very quickly um, uh, had to start and uh, to to get on that platform. And so, the first implementation we did we did implement um, SAP ERP, and we with the first initial implementation was in 16 weeks, where we leveraged. Um, SAP's all-in-one solution for uh, automotive, and uh, we were able to, um, you know, take a pr put a, a pretty big footprint of SAP uh, live for our company uh, relatively uh, quickly. So with the initial implementation, we did um, ECC, we did the SAP portal, we put up a business intelligence. Uh, and uh, so after that, we have since then implemented SAP CRM, and, and shortly after that, we also implemented uh, SAP BPC. So, Michael, you know, a lot of uh, people when they think of SAP, you know, if they haven't experienced it firsthand, uh, might think of it as a, a platform just for really big companies, right? And here, you are uh, an organization that certainly has uh, large ambitions, is accomplishing great things. But a startup uh, implementing BPC uh, and uh, and SAP, right? And so I, yep. I guess I'd be interested in uh, you know understanding what were some of the tips and tricks. Uh, what was what was it that led to your success and and being able to implement that solution so quickly? Yeah, I mean, so I think for any company, uh, the complexity is the same. Uh, I think whether you're a, a, a relatively small company or a growing company, or whether you're a Big company. A lot of the complexities are, are there. So obviously, for us, we we knew. Uh, I mean, our ambition is to to be uh, an OEM uh, and be a big OEM. And so we knew that we only had the luxury of being relatively small um, for a very short period of time. So we knew we had to kind of make sure that we could could have a platform that we could uh, continue to scale and and take tackle the complexity that comes with. With being a global uh, OEM, and so and for us, SAP was the perfect fit because of the all-in-one solution, right? So these, uh, this all-in-one solution that is built upon best practices, uh, pre predefined best practices, business processes, and just being able to take those out of the box and leverage those, and basically say, yeah, this is this is best practices. These processes, they are definitely good enough for us, for us, and so. Let's leverage those and let's implement those and let's make sure that our company operates in that way. And, and that's something that was very much um, a conscious decision for us. It was very much ingrained and very much supported by our C-level executives as well. And so that's something that we've had a lot of, uh, of success with. That's great. I mean, do you have any uh, comments to, to share about uh, your relationship with RJT and our experiences together. So, of course. So, RGT uh, is our uh, SI systems integrator. Uh, they have been with us uh, from day one and have been an, an absolute integral part of, of our uh, success. And what we really liked about RGT, well, for, I mean, there was a couple things we liked both about SAP and RGT. We liked the, with SAP, we liked the leadership aspect, the fact that they're a market leader and that they have the, the thought leadership in the industry as well, the automotive industry. And that you know, the customer comes first. That we all, we saw that you know, SAP's mindset is very is very much that, hey, um, they're only successful if we're successful. So we really like that. And we saw the same with RJT. We saw that RJT uh, is a strong partner in the in the SAP ecosystem. 
that really understood our industry and really understood how to take advantage of these and, and implement these all-in-one solutions. So it, it, it has been and continues to be a very uh, very strong partnership, and we're very happy with, uh, with RGT as, a, as our SI. Thanks, thanks for the kind words. Um, maybe just before we get into the demonstration that, that we're going to have here, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the analytics and uh, performance management platform that SAP brings. I mean, SAP is well known for its uh, ERP uh, implementations and, and uh, technologies, but uh, really got in, you know, in the last, I don't know, what, five to seven years into this uh, whole analytics and performance management space, and that, that seems to be all anybody talks about anymore. Uh, but right. how, is, how is that technology uh, influencing your business? And I, I guess after that answer, we can, we can go ahead and jump into the demonstration. Sure. Um, so in, in my simple mind, you know, with given the task of, again, making sure that we had a system that supports our operational processes, uh, the, uh, very early on, you know, we basically said, look, if there's data out there, we're going to grab it. And uh, the data that we grab, we're going to stick in one location so that we can, we, we have one s single version of the truth. It is controlled and you can report off of it. And also you can do um, correlation analysis later on that you not, might never have thought of uh, up front, right? And so uh, we have one data warehouse and it's called SAP Business Intelligence or SAP BI. And uh, that's where all the data flows. We did also... Uh, and so, and we're leveraging, uh, we're leveraging a lot of um, standard info cubes out of BW. We are, we have some of the Bob J uh, pieces. We are using Webby now, and as the company matures, more and more reporting um, demands out there, or analytical demands and requirements are out there, and, and we're actually very uh, quickly giving tools to our uh, to our business users because we we put that foundation in place. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about BPC as well. So, I mean, BPC, we have also elected to implement BPC, and BPC also takes data out of BW, um, and we elected to implement BPC for uh, financial planning, financial planning and financial modeling. And, uh, you know, it was, again, in that scenario where, you know, frankly, we were doing financial planning on a, on a very elaborate spreadsheet-type application, and, and we needed to have something that was more robust, something that could handle many more variables, that could handle many more what-if scenarios and what-if analyses, and also something that, frankly, that we could go to our investors and to our board and say, look, I mean, we've done this planning and this analysis, and it's done in a tool that um, uh, is that that stands up to uh, controls, to internal audit and controls. And uh, RGT was also very instrumental in, in, um, in, in helping us get get that component uh, up and running and it's it's very much a vital tool for us today uh, for anything that has to do with with planning in our company well and, you know one of the things I think is most exciting about your particular uh, BPC implementation is that uh, as a company you've really taken ownership of that right after the initial implementation uh, you were able to get folks internally that really understood that tool and You've really expanded it and uh, and and made it a. It seems like an integral part of uh, who you are as a business. No, absolutely. And and if one just one more point to that. So again, part of the vision uh, of, of of how to set up um, the IT infrastructure in this company, uh, and and this is came comes straight from the co-founder. He said, "Look, I'm, Michael, I want I want drivers and I want mechanics." And, and what he meant was that, look, I, I want to make sure that the ownership of these business systems lies in the business organization, lies within sales, finance, after sales, marketing, purchasing, wherever it, it is. And I want drivers in those in those departments that know that that knows how to use the system very well, that are the ones that can can do analytical reporting and can do all these different things. And then I want the mechanics, I want those to be on the IT side. And, of course, mechanics are good drivers, but they're the guys who can also kind of really work on, uh, under the, the hood. So, But I think the most important thing was, you know, the, the fact that the ownership of the application lies with the business. And, and that's something that we've been pushing very hard for and something that I think we've been very um, successful in doing as well. 
And when it comes to BPC, frankly, I don't have anybody on my team on the IT side that, that does anything with BPC. The ownership of that uh, really uh, is all lies uh, on the business side. We have some really good, really strong drivers, some really strong business analysts uh, uh, that uh, is doing all that work on the BPC side, uh, on the business side. So that uh, has been a very, I think, positive surprise for us that we didn't really have to have, um, you know, uh, uh, a mechanic on that side, on, on the IT side. That's fantastic. And, you know, our hat's off to you. Uh, obviously, that makes it a lot less expensive to adopt these tools and get the type of return that you're looking for. Um, yes. So with that, um, first, uh, you know, thanks again, Michael, for making making the time, uh, for sharing some of your comments. Uh, I'm assuming you'll stick around for some questions uh, towards the end of the, the presentation here. Absolutely. Great. Um, let's go ahead and uh, kick off the, uh, the presentation of uh, BPC to introduce uh, everybody on the call to that solution. Five minutes, we're going to go through a demonstration of BPC. Before we go, I'd just like to bring up a couple PowerPoints and kind of set the stage for this application can bring to you. There's a lot of different vendors in the uh, performance market arena, but the bottom line is any which way, shape, or form, if you want to do a uh, budgeting, planning, forecast, or any kind of uh, performance management application, all all companies have the same type of data. They've got structured data and unstructured data. The structured data is relational. Could be ERP, HR, CRM, LOB, legacy, what have you. There's also a lot of uh, unstructured data. Matter of fact, Gartner says 80% of uh, all performance management data really comes from unstructured data, such as spreadsheets and Word files and emails. Now, some of the other vendors in the space, they do more of a module based approach. And what that means is that there's a module for reporting, planning, consolidation, forecasting. And the problem with this is the fact that you have to load this information up from your sources into each of these different modules. And if you make changes of one module to the next, you have to make sure that those are in sync. So you might have some integration points at this point. From an end user perspective, they might have to learn multiple front ends to uh, be able to work with the uh, different modules that are out there. Some could be green screen or proprietary. From SAP, we kind of take the same, well, a different approach to it. Take the same data, the same structured data, unstructured data, but you're loading it once to a unified platform. Now, what does a unified platform do? Again, you load it once as one set of security, one set of data, one set of metadata. When you make changes, you make a change once, not to multiple modules that flows through the entire application. From an end user point of view, you're not learning all these different uh, proprietary front ends. You're working with stuff that you work with every day. Microsoft Office Suite, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, web browser. And if you have a portal strategy, we can also serve up any of the BPC information via that strategy as well. The three key things I'd like you to take away from this demonstration today is the fact that this is designed for the end user. Again, working with very familiar tools, the Excel or the uh, Office Suite rather, zero footprint web interface. So as long as you can get through your uh, firewall, you'll be able to get to your information regardless of where you are. Context-sensitive action panes, you're not going to have to memorize hundreds of different menu entries and when to click what. Based on where you are in the app and who you are, you'll have certain op options available to you, regardless of the front end, web, or any of the office interfaces. It's enterprise scalable and better for business, business process flows and dashboarding. With that in mind, let's go ahead and jump right on into the demonstration. What you're looking at here is the launch page for BPC. This is a dashboard in the body of the screen. And within this dashboard, and you can set this up, everything you see is going to be an example. Within this dashboard, I see uh, different KPIs in the top left, KPI analysis, pie chart, bar chart on the right, and uh, business process flows in the bottom left. This information can be served up from BPC and or other sources of information. It doesn't matter where the data is coming from. It's electronic. You can show it within dashboarding capabilities. If we want to go to another dashboard, here's a report library so I can run reports from here. You've also got some other capabilities. I can use a what-if calculator here. Maybe my unit price goes up or down. How does that affect my totals, my profit? You can see these calculations by graphics change as I start doing some what-ifs. And the powerful capability here is that when I see a what-if scenario I really like, 
I can go ahead and save this scenario with anything I'd like and send it back as my drivers to build maybe my next month's forecast or next year's target. So that's some of the information within the dashboarding. For this demonstration, what I'd like to do is cover a couple different examples or different types of users. So I'd like to jump in first as an analyst who gets a call from maybe the CFO. We're having some revenue issues for a certain product, look into it, but there's no reports out there to find it, so we need to build a report from scratch. And then jump in as a budget user who has to go through the steps to fill in their budget and just show you how a business process flow works. So let's start off the reporting capability. You've got a lot of different uh, uh, capabilities within VPC to report. I can do web reporting, or I can report on any of my different front ends, including Excel, Word, PowerPoint. So I'm going to jump into Excel first. And Excel, of course, is something that everybody knows and loves. Um, this is not going to be Excel-like or excel light. This is true native Excel with an added. So everything you've been able to do before you can still do. I'm working with 2007. It could be 2003 or 2010. So I've got the action pane here. Based on who I am and where I am, this is what I can do. I'd like to start off with the reporting analysis. A couple different flavors on building a new one versus open up an existing report. Under building new, start from scratch, drag and drop, or use the dynamic template library, which ships with the application. These are best practice reports that every company seems to love. So if I jump in here, there's a comparative, or an any by any, show me cost center by time, or entity by account, or whatever dimension by whatever other dimension. And there's quite a slew of these. You can add to these, you can take away from these, or you can tweak each and every one of these. I'm going to go ahead and choose a comparative, hit open, and if I hit open, it tells me reports have been built for me. It's important to note that uh, the data does not reside in Excel. Excel is simply going back to the database, pulling out the data as of right now. So if the data changes, this will automatically update. I'm looking at a regional hierarchy, North America, Europe, Asia, Pack rule in the International Motors Corp., a fictitious motor company, car company. We're looking at current year's actuals, current budget dollar and percent variance. You've also got stop layer here. If it's good, it's green. If it's okay, it's yellow. If it's red, it's bad. Up in my title area, we're going to corporate for the account profit after tax for all products for September in U.S. dollars scaled to thousands. Now, I don't know about you. I'm more graphical in nature. Perhaps I'd like to see us more along the lines with a graph. So if you know how to do it in Excel, you know how to do it here. I like the range. Insert. I'll do a column chart, maybe a three-dimensional. Place it, size it, and there's my graph. If I wanted to put a calculation in here, for example, what's the uh, percentage of North America to total corporate? Well, let's see. Okay. Insert a column, and here it's simply type in what you want. Percent of total, and this is going to be equal to the sum that's left divided by divided by the total. And I'll go ahead and enter that. And before I do that, perhaps I'd like to uh, lock in the total with an F2. So when I copy paste, make that an absolute reference. Control C, Control V. And maybe we'll format that as a percentage. A couple decimal points. And in no time at all, we formatted a report. We've added a graph to it. We've thrown in calculations. Now, where the rubber really hits the road here is, okay, I, I don't know about you, but I look at percentages or, uh, I'm sorry, more along the lines of things in red, they kind of grab my eye, exceptions, if you will. And I see I've got a big negative 11% uh, variance here in Europe. Well, if you look up here, you've got the CV or current view, if I expand it. If we look at entities, you'll notice I've got multiple hierarchies. I've got this uh, legal entity basis hierarchy in International Motors Corp. If we open up the Motors Corp, there's North America, Europe, Asia, PAC. If we open up North America and open up U.S., we see East, West, roll up the U.S., and so on. If we open up the legal basis, another hierarchy, and open up domestic, here's East again. Same sales. Let's say there's 100,000 in sales for East. Well, that 100,000 is going to roll up to domestic and then up to corporate legal. That 100 will also roll up to U.S. to North America. So you can report on this any which way, shape, or form you want. Create multiple hierarchies for your reporting needs. Now, what I'd like to do is graphically look at this and say, all right, we've got Europe. We've got a negative variance. I'd like to drill on that. How do you drill? You double-click. A couple things to note here is I double-click on that. 
Notice that my calculations automatically update. So it expands. I've got more children here. The calculations are there, and my graphic automatically updates. My biggest variance happens to be with Great Britain. So you can keep drilling for your heart's content. Sooner or later, you get down to the bottom. I can't drill any further in Great Britain. But you don't want to change your analysis here. You don't want to stop it. What you want to do is change your focus on it. How do you do that? Instead of looking at entities by column or row, rather, let's look at P&L accounts. As we open up P&L accounts, here's revenues and costs. Notice that 151 plus 51 gives you 100%. Why is that? They're contra accounts. It understands if you take an expense and you add into it a revenue, it's going to subtract that. So that's built-in functionality. Notice that the revenues are in red, so we can drill in on the revenues. But again, we've got the graphics update, the calculations update. When we drill in the revenues, here's your revenue information. And again, everything's in black. Everything's fine with the exception of the third-party revenue. We can drill in on that, and sooner or later, you get down to the bottom. Don't want to change. I don't want to stop here. So instead, let's see if by now our products. Is this happening against all products? As we drop in products, the biggest variance happens to be with our sedan family. As we drill into sedans, here are my different sedans. The X100, C100, X2, and X300. We've got actuals of three quarters of a million. We budgeted a million in sales. So we're off by a quarter of a million or 27%. At this point, again, we could have drilled as far as we could, but perhaps you'd like to find out more information on this intersection. This is where a lot of other applications, okay, we need to get out of here, go back to our transaction system, and find all the transactions that are making that. Well, we offer you a drill through. So what I've got the ability to do here is simply click on that number. When in doubt, go to the action pane. Here's drill through. I'd like to view it via Excel or the browser. I'll choose Excel. This can open up another tab down here at the bottom. It's going to show me all those transactions for Great Britain, for the X100 family. Here's the number ordered, the number shipped, and uh, the uh, number left on hold. So we ordered six, or the dealership ordered six. They're accepting three, but they decided to put three on hold. And we find that there's a relatively high number of units on hold here. So, for example, now we found what the issue is. I'll go back to the report with Great Britain for third-party revenue for sedans. And what I'd like to do is now communicate and collaborate around this. And how do I let the powers that be know if there's an issue in this intersection? I can add a new comment. Upon adding a new comment, I simply walk through here and I add, I, I select from this wizard. Anytime I see anything in orange, it's prompting me for information. This is going to be your list. This might be a critical or a high priority. I'll go with a high UOH for units on hold, a short text type of searchable field for commentary. Got to learn how to type. <laughs> For some reason, my my uh, Y isn't working. It's coming with a Z of units on hold. Interesting. So I'll go ahead and choose OK there. Comma has been stored in the database. Now, why is that important? First off, I'm going to drill back up. Remember, I drilled down on the sedan family. So if I use that and drill back up, your sedans, SUVs, and trucks, we drill back down on sedans. What we're looking at now is a little note here saying very high number of units on hold. So that's stored in the database. You didn't see that a moment ago, only when you get down to this intersection. And you'll see this, this uh, data within other intersections of other reports. So anytime you see it at 729, that's available anywhere. There's also other types of commentary reports that you can run. So with that in mind, what we did in this quick example is we built a report. We formatted it with calculations. We threw in a graphic. We started drilling into it, finding certain areas, letting the red, letting the exceptions kind of let us know where to drill, and then finally drilling right through to either a staging table and or the actual source, depending on whether or not IT allows you to go back to source or whether you do work with staging tables. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to shift gears and move on back to uh, the launch page. Now let's go ahead and open up a business process flow and put on the uh, end user hat, someone who needs to contribute to the budget. I can either click on a business process flow down here and I'll run it, or when in doubt, open up a business process flow right from the action pane. And upon clicking business process flow, I'm presented with another wizard driven process. So I'd like to open up this thing called, in this case, annual budget. Hit the green arrow to move off to the next step. And as you walk through this, it's going to step through exactly what needs to be done. This could be automated, so the users would already have this done. They just simply click, and they're already in the process. 
But at this point, for a category, let's run this for budget version two. So we've already done the original, we've done budget version one. Now we'd like to start changing and comparing against budget version one, modifying that to version two at this point. So let's go ahead and grab that. And I'm going to do this for, let's go with the Italian entity. So that's going to be under Europe. And we'll do this for an entire year as opposed to a month. So I'll go ahead and grab the year I want to work with. And OK. Green check mark or green arrow to accept that and move off to the next. And if you didn't have rights to this, you wouldn't see those intersections as you're working through this. So now, as an end user, what is it I have to do? Well, business process flows are going to offer you navigation and guide you through a process. It's a sequential process completely defined by you. So I've got step one, step two, and step three. And as you walk through these different steps, realistically, this step one is more along the lines of a power user or administrator that are going to set your currency rates, your human craft capital rates. So if you hire a new director, it's going to be X salary, or maybe everybody's getting a certain percentage raise, or your FICA rates are going to be a, a certain uh, uh, number. You pick and choose how you want to work with that. But these are the different targets that you can set or different rates. You can set tops down targets. So as your users go in here, they see where the corporate believes you should be. So you can kind of compare against that. And then each time, we've also got this uh, report version comparison. There's another version comparison in here as well, as well as down here. But the end user, what we need to do is really get into the budget information, enter this information, run reports, and see how we're doing. On this business process flow, I've also got a graphic. On this graphic, I can see on my key accounts how I'm doing for budget version one, budget version two, and I don't have any targets set yet. How do you move through a business process flow? Notice that this one says review required, and this one's unavailable. So the power users have gone in here, made all the changes. What they need to do now is say, okay, we're going to review this step. So somebody made a change, and this is one of those gaps you could pop in here, a little stop gap where, okay, you've made the changes, someone needs to approve these changes before you continue on. So as an approver, I can look at this and see, okay, I can review my rates, I can review my standard capital expenditures, my targets, and if I'm happy, I can accept or I can reject it. So I'm going to go ahead and accept it, and a couple things are going to happen on this acceptance. One, it's going to say that this has been reviewed, and step two, which is black right now, is now going to be open for business where I can go in here and start making changes. There'll be blue live dynamic links. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is kind of start off with uh, perhaps entering uh, employee-related information. So as we pop in employee-related information, and again, everything I show you here is an example. You can get as granular or as summarized as you'd like. So within this, what we're looking at is entering information by way of right down the employee. You can do it by job codes or titles or whatever level of summarization. But as we look at this, okay, I've got some uh, information here for my employees, what position they are, and then perhaps my HR system. I load this information. Oh, the anniversary date or the start date for new hires. Here's the annual salary. This could be read from a global variable, or you can do a, a manual date entry here to give them a percent increase by year to give you a new salary. You can transfer to what department, promote to a new position, or you can terminate. And you can also have the uh, ability to throw in explanations. You saw textual data that we entered back in the uh, ad hoc report. This is another way to enter uh, textual information. So a couple different what ifs we can do here. For example, maybe uh, Pino is going to get a 5% raise. Notice that that went from 85 to 86. Uh, Fabrizio, instead of 4%, we're going to go with 10%. This is important. This, the uh, maximum salary increase is uh, 6%. Explanations for everything over 6% are required and will require a separate approval process. Do you want to continue, yes or no? As opposed to all or none on certain rules, you can have these different exceptions. And different eyes would go ahead and look at this and either, yes, I'm going to accept it, or no, I'm not. So you can't sneak things in, if you will. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, I still want to make that change, but I'll tell you what. If I'm making change of 10%, I'm going to jump over here to the explanation and just say this person's a rock star. If this person leaves, we're going to lose a lot of business. And then, for example, uh, Danielle Della Casa, maybe we're going to transfer her. Another department, maybe 
general admin. And again, we can add information here. At this point, I can save this information simply by hitting submit, and this automatically updates the database with automatic aggregation, automatic currency translation on the fly. This is from an, uh, an exempt. If you want to go with a non-exempt type of uh, functionality here, you can also do it by your new hires, or any hire rather, that are uh, paid by way of hourly, hourly wages. So here's my regular wage rate, how many hours a week, what the overtime wage rate is. You can go ahead and make changes, but again, same type of functionality, but now you're doing it by hours versus by salary. Completely your call. When I'm done with this, I can simply click on Back to VPF, Back to Business Process Flow, and this will bring me back to the screen in which we used to launch this. Now, if I wanted to see the results of any changes that I made, and you think about what we did there, it wasn't rocket science. You go in there, okay, I'm going to increase this person's wage, I'm going to do this, I'm going to move that person here to there. You think about all the stuff that happens in the background. And if we jump into personnel expenses, for example, we weren't prompted for any of this information. This is stuff that the system is automatically going to go ahead and calculate. So here's our employees, their position, the departments. Here's this, uh, both the exempt and non-exempt salaries. But then you get into health insurance, dental, life, vision, disability, all your tax information, 401k, other benefits, Medicare, training, fringe. All these things are automatically calculated. So you're throwing in, okay, I'm going to increase this person's time 5% or I'm going to move this person from one department to the next. All these fringe benefits and taxes are automatically calculated to give you the fully burdened employee-related expense. That's all built into the system. You don't have to have your users worry about that in any way, shape, or form. So that's one methodology of doing data entry. A, uh, another method here, I'll grab another business process flow for this one. I'm sorry, another uh, report within this business process flow for this one. Uh, let's say, for example, we want to start entering some expense-related information. Could be G&A expense, could be virtually anything you want. So as I jump in this report, this is going to be, again, another example. I'm going to show you quite a few different examples of how you can do this to give you a flavor. But here we're looking at, again, Italy, Sales uh, Cost Center for Budget Version 2. Look at supplies, down through other miscellaneous. Here's our prior year forecast. Percent increase, decrease. So if we go rent goes up 10%, notice that everything up here did, in fact, change. If supplies drops down to 2%, that changes. You can have, all right, insurance. We just got the bill. It's not 22000 but next year it's 25000 And that automatically spreads. Or, yeah, spreads over the uh, current budget based on this methodology. And what does that mean? Well, 25,000 spread evenly is pretty straightforward, or 445 pretty straightforward, but you can define your own. For example, we've defined a fast growth, maybe a slow growth, fast decline, slow decline. You can call it whatever you want. So as I look at supplies, gee, I, I know my cost center better than the people that set this template, so I really want to spread this evenly. Or maybe I'd like to spread this by way of calendar days or by work days within that month. You can pick and choose whatever makes sense. <clears throat> As you look at this, you're making these certain changes. If I want to make these changes and keep them, I can submit them. Again, this is going to write it back to the database and automatically update. Uh, I'll do the automatic aggregations and currency translations throughout. So any report I write or run, it will automatically bring up those differences. This will just take a moment to run. After it runs the calculations, you'll notice that it submitted this many, except this many, we had no errors. If you had errors, it would let you know. <laughs> so at this point, okay, we're done with uh, entering information, showing you different spreading type of capabilities. A couple other things I'd like to point out here is the fact that there's uh, numerous types of data entry functionalities. So, for example, if we want to do capital expenditures, I do have a report data entry template that can do just that. If we uh, take a closer look at the uh, enter capital expenditures, this is going to behave pretty much a lot like the uh, employer-related one does. 
where your users, if they're going through here, gee, we're going to budget that we need a new PC or we need new printers and new assets of one thing or another. The beauty is, is that you don't have to have your users understand depreciation rules or lifetimes of assets and do all those calculations. Based on what the asset is and perhaps the project, it's going to automatically bring in the life of that asset. If I pop in, all right, it's going to be uh, 100 here. It understands that we're buying 100 of these at $1,000 a piece. So there's your initial outlay. It starts with depreciation over 60 months or five years. It also understands that 2010 is going to roll all the way into 2015 over five years. This is stuff that the users don't need to know. They simply enter what the quantity is. If they wanted to add a brand new one on the fly, they've also got the ability to go ahead and insert. So, for example, maybe I'd like to pop in that we're getting a new software or new equipment. And what's that equipment going to be? It could be new laptops. So I can go ahead and pop in information that way. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. But it's very simple to enter information as you go. Again, upon a calculation or upon submission of data, it's going to go ahead and calculate the depreciation over time. It's going to update all your expenses all the way down to your P&Ls, your cash flows, and your balance sheets. As you wrap up with this, as you enter your information and make your changes, what you may want to do is kind of see where you're doing or how you're doing against the uh, Again, where you're supposed to be or prior version. So if I bring up this version category or version comparison report, if you will, upon bringing this up, this is showing me budget version 2 against budget version 1 against total target. Let me just change this to uh, all my products where we can actually get to uh, an intersection of data where we've got something. And all uh, departments. So at this point, again, I told you we didn't set our targets, but here's our budget version 2. Here's our budget version 1. Right now, we have no variance. If we went ahead and made some changes, we'd see that. We did enter in some information for some of our expenses, which is starting to drive our other department expenses. So we can start seeing the deltas and the bogeys in here and start explaining why we're off. And you saw the currency conversion. You saw the uh, commentary you could throw in here. Completely up to you how you want to set this up. So at this point, just a quick way to compare any category of data against any other category. Within this demonstration, what you've seen is building a report from scratch, uh, adding calculations to it, throw in uh, graphical information, throw in a uh, commentary in the database, drilling back to a source system, then logging in as a uh, budget user and going through a budget process. And when I'm done with this whole budget process, how do I move off to the next step? I simply say, this step is completed, and I'll move off to step three. And with that, that wraps up the demonstration. Thank you very much. John, thanks for uh, going through that with us. I um, guess uh, now we can go ahead and open it up uh, for questions. We probably have, I don't know, a little over, what, six, seven minutes, something like that. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions. We'd be happy to, to take those uh, um, live here. Or uh, if there aren't, you can certainly reach out to us directly and, uh, and talk to us. Uh, directly about any specific questions that you have. Michael, are you still there? I'm still here, yeah. Fantastic. So, Charles, we did have one question come into the Q&A panel. Um, we actually, we've had a couple come in so far, but the first one's from uh, Mike who asked, uh, we have deployed BPC 10.0. How much of the functionality demonstrated has changed, and fundamentally, how has it changed? So that's a great question. Uh, there actually are some, and I don't know if we can ask the question back to Michael, but uh, I don't know if he's using the NetWeaver version or the Microsoft version. Uh, there are some nuances between those uh, two versions. We're using the Microsoft version. Got it. Um, so on, on uh, version 10.0, there is uh, actually quite a bit of uh, additional integration between uh, the Business Object Suite as well as VPC. Uh, and additional integration between uh, SAP, ERP system, and uh, BW and BPC. So there's uh, a significant amount of additional integration that's available available there that you know, provides value across the stack. Uh, in addition to that, um, a number of the user interfaces, you know, as easy as you saw them here, uh, they actually have gotten even better. And uh, the the web interface. Is uh, is much more powerful. 
uh, some of the administration capabilities are even more uh, powerful, and we weren't really able to get into a lot of those details today, uh, given the time constraints. But um, certainly welcome the opportunity to talk to you uh, one-on-one -on -one and, and uh, compare and contrast those differences a little bit. Okay, uh, we had a couple questions from Rose. Uh, her first one is, uh, any experience using uh, BPC NetWeaver? Yeah, absolutely. So RGT's uh, was founded in uh, 1996 uh, as a core ERP uh, partner of, of SAP's. And so really our, the, the roots of our organization uh, go back to that uh, ECC, A1, uh, BW space, and so there's a, a wide uh, or a, a deep set of capabilities there. Um, uh, Michael, you can speak to the, the fact uh, that you know, we, we were uh, instrumental in, in rolling out BW there at uh, Fisker Automotive. Yeah, correct. And, and, you know, I mean, when we looked at uh, BPC and we were trying to make a decision between NetWeaver and the Microsoft version, this is, uh, well, at least a year and a half ago, and at the time, uh, it, it, the feedback that we got, and it could have changed many times, I'm just going to tell you straight out, the, time, the feedback that we got at the time was that uh, the NetWeaver version would be um, uh, a quicker implementation than, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Microsoft version would be a quicker implementation than the NetWeaver implementation. So we, we d went down the Microsoft route and we uh, leveraged um, a lot of the extractors and basically started extracting data straight out of SAP into the uh, Microsoft version. Since then, we have actually moved those extractors over to BW so that the Microsoft version is basically getting its data from SAP BW. So it's a, it's a SAP to BW extract uh, that's going on. But, um, and so I can't really talk, talk I, I don't have really have any experience with the NetWeaver version, so I, can't, I couldn't really tell you uh, anything in addition to, to that, except that we have not really had any problems with the Microsoft version, and getting data uh, uh, through BW to the Microsoft version has not is not an issue at all. And Great. then the so second question that I see Rose is asking is, um, if we're getting data from any other source systems other than SAP, and at, at, right now in our BPC, uh, uh, systems we are not. We're getting, we are getting all source data from SAP. Great. And Rose, uh, just from a capabilities perspective, um, certainly wanted to speak to the fact that uh, we have very experienced consultants both on the NetWeaver and uh, Microsoft versions of the product, and would be more than happy to have a conversation with you about. If there's uh, some challenges that you're running into or looking for some tips and tricks, uh, we'd be happy to have that conversation. Okay, Charles, we had a question. It was actually sent to me privately in the chat, but it's from Akil who asked about um, how successful is integration with HANA for consolidation and planning? That's, uh, it's pretty new, right? And, uh, and so currently that's, that's in the ramp up. And so I would say that the vision is very compelling. Uh, to be able to uh, put these applications in memory uh, provides significant benefit uh, to business users. Uh, that's something that is uh, evolving right now, right? And so uh, what we recommend is that we have, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation with that organization and make sure that HANA is the right move at this time but we are seeing a number of organizations that think that is the right thing to do and uh, are seeing very significant improvements in performance and uh, helping them to accomplish goals uh, uh, you know, to get their business uh, more on a real-time basis. But we, we think that it's important to have, uh, have that conversation one-on-one -on -one and, and make sure that you're, uh, you're making that decision uh, based on the criteria that are specific to your organization. Actually, had Joe, this is, Joe, Joe, this is Michael. I mean, we we do not have Hana in our environment today, but we're actually also very interested in, in learning more about what that will look like. 
Akil uh, states that they are currently implementing HANA and they're looking forward to implementing VPC later. So he was just interested if there were any, if you, if you knew of any uh, integration success stories. So, well, so you know, from that perspective, uh, I, I'm sure that you know you're aware that uh, data services and, and data extractors. There, there are some native data, data extractors that that integrate the the two tools, and uh, and so. Um, getting information in and out of HANA uh, is something that you can actually leverage existing skill sets uh, to do that. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I uh, would welcome you know additional follow-up on that if, if we'd like to get into more some de more detail. Um, and actually, this is another question related to HANA. Uh, comes from Elizabeth, who uh, says that they're on uh, 7.5 SQL, pulling data directly from SAP ECC. Uh, wants to know if they can move to a HANA version of BPC without using BW or uh, Netweaver. That's a fairly specific uh, question, I'm guessing. That's, so. a, that's a pretty specific question, right? So I, I think we we probably should uh, address that directly offline. Yep. Um, absolutely. So um, the contact information for Charles is up on the up on the screen. So uh, feel free to you know kind of forward that question over to him as well. Um, we have a time for maybe one or two questions over the phone line. So um, if you want to ask a question over the phone line, all you have to do is hit star six on your telephone keypad, uh, and that will unmute your phone line. So you can go ahead and ask your question after you've done that. Again, it's star six on your telephone keypad, and that will unmute your phone line. Any questions over the phone? Well, Charles, it sounds like we don't have any questions over the phone, and we've gotten through all the ones that have been sent in to us. Did you or uh, Michael have any final comments that you would like to go through? I guess uh, one one last thing I, I would say is that you know it's kind of uh, opportune that we're we're having this conversation at this time, you know, week before ASUG and, and Sapphire in Orlando, and uh, I will be presenting uh, on Monday, uh, and really the presentation is uh, about how do you implement a solution like this. In an affordable way, and in a way that uh, you know you really get the return on investment that you're you're looking for, and and so I, I believe that that presentation is at two o'clock on Monday. Uh, obviously, invite anybody that's on the call to to join me there, and be happy to join uh, answer any questions that you have uh, face to face. Um, and uh, Michael, are you going to be there as well? I will. Yeah, I will be. Yeah. And uh, Joe, I just want to say thank you to you and ASOC for uh, putting this together. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks a lot, Michael. And again, we encourage everyone who's attending uh, attending ASOC Annual Conference, SAP Sapphire now, to uh, check out Charles's presentation. Um, we look forward to having uh, as many people as we can at Annual Conference this year. Excellent. Thanks again, Joe. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for making the time. That does conclude our webcast for today. Just a final reminder that the presentation and recording will be sent out to all the registrants and posted to asub.com. Look to the events calendar for future webcasts. Uh, we have uh, things of interest to almost everyone. Uh, also, uh, again, a final reminder about ASUC Annual Conference, uh, SAP Sapphire, that's coming up uh, starting on Monday of next week. Thanks again for your participation today, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.